All right, so this morning, uh, I want to talk on the subject is uh, finding the courage to pray. Finding the courage to pray. You know, God is uh, invincible. And uh, I think for a lot of us, or a lot of people in the world, uh, it kind of sometimes sounds really strange that you should bow down your heads and talk to <laughs> somebody, address somebody that you don't see, you know, with your eyes. But however, you are drawn to believe that he is there and that he is hearing you speak. You know, that's, it takes a lot of courage to do that. But a lot of people don't have it. They don't. And so they don't, they don't bother to pray. They don't bother to call upon this God. And uh, the truth, according to the Bible, is that God has given so much evidence in the world in which we, we live for everybody to be aware of a divine presence to acknowledge him. But I think... People just ignore that fact. And some just deliberately just refuse to, even when it is obvious. And so, um, this morning I want to try and explain some things from the Bible. And I trust that by the grace of God, it will bless somebody here today. Let's bow down our heads. Father, we thank you. And we praise your holy name for today. It's a good day. And we thank you, Father, for this gathering. We are gathered here because the scriptures commands us to do so. And you have assured us in your word that where two or three are gathered together. In your name, you are there in the midst of them. And so we rejoice in Christ Jesus for your presence here with us right now. We commit, O oh God, these deliberations into your hands and pray that, Lord, you speak to us. You reveal yourself to us through the scriptures and establish us in righteousness. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So finding the courage to pray. Psalm 66, verse 18. It's as if I regard iniquity in my heart. The Lord will not hear me. So I want to lay some foundations first and foremost. God is holy. So, if you want to approach him, you must address the issue of sin. I don't think you can just go into the White House or into the office of any authority and just dress anyhow. You want to look presentable. You want your whole outfit to be accepted. This is in the natural. So when you go to the manager's office or the chief executive's office, you want to approach that place with grace. More so if you have a petition, a request that you want to be heard. That is why a lot of times, even criminals, when they come to court, you see them dressed very nice, you know, very beautiful. What is the whole purpose? It is to carry some grace because they know they're in the situation where they need mercy. Anyway. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity, 
In other words, to regard means that it is obvious and you are not doing anything about it. Then it's not good. So if you are approaching God, the first thing to do always is to examine yourself. To see if there is anything that God himself is pointing out to you to deal with before you approach him. God is holy. So you just don't come to him and begin to talk to him. So if there is that conviction, it is important to address it. God is merciful. So if you become sincere about that, and you ask God to forgive you. He will forgive you. Because the Bible is telling us that if I regard it and I don't do anything about it. Then the Lord, he will not hear me. So sin is going to be a barrier. When your conscience is speaking to you and telling you that, hey, you got to check this out. Please stop. And ask God to forgive you. Ask for his mercy. Because if you don't do that, all your words will just bounce back. God will not hear you. Psalm 19, verse 13. The psalm is right. It says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. What is he saying by being presumptuous? The word indicates an intentional, rebellious, or sinful act by a person, individual, or people. Those who sin presumptuously say, in effect, I'm going to do this and nothing is going to stop me. I know what God says about it and I don't care if it is wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. So when you have this type of attitude, and there are a lot of people who are like that in the church, they really don't care about what God's commandment says about righteousness. In their minds, they have this concept that God is good. And so, they can live anyhow, regardless of the commandments that are obvious, and still expect God's blessing in their lives. I just want to refer to three examples without really going to those passages. The first one is the story about Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Moses had ascended into the mountain to communicate with God. And it seemed like it was taking forever. So the people became impatient. And they decided to do something different. They advised and then, you know, collected all uh, the jewels that was in the camp. Gold, silver, whatever. And they put it in fire, melted it and created a golden calf to worship. And said, this is our God. They were being presumptuous. You know, and you know what happened when Moses returned and he saw what was going on. He was very, very mad. Another example is uh, King David and Bathsheba. You know, he, 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 he did what he wasn't supposed to do as a king. I believe that because of his authority as a king... He felt he could have anything that he needed and saw that he felt good about. So he used his authority. And while men were at war, he 
he subdued one of the general's wife and compromise that. But we know the consequences. You know. <clears throat> Another example I want to cite is the story of King Uzziah. King Uzziah, when you read the book of Isaiah, he did a great, great, mighty work for the people of Israel. He was very successful. And in his days, there was a lot of prosperity. But it got to the point where the prosperity put him in a situation that he became prideful. So he chose to go into the temple and offer incense to God. A role that was assigned and reserved specifically for the priest to do. He was warned against it. But he refused. And he went and offered the incense. It wasn't long after that that he died. So presumptuous sins, they are very dangerous. They may seem like you can get away with it. But be very careful. When you know obviously that this is wrong. And you persist in that behavior. It is not good. So David, I believe, wrote this psalm, says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. So let us all examine ourselves when we have come to God. You know, especially in the charismatic or, you know, um, Pentecostal churches. We tend to sometimes take God for granted because we think we can pray, we can shout and everything. And so we just come and we just begin to talk to God. But it is important to always approach God with reverence. Hallelujah. Psalm 32 verse 5. The writer of this psalm says, I acknowledge. He's putting the torchlight on himself. He says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So, obviously over here you can see that he is being honest and sincere with himself. Remember the statement Jesus made when the woman at the well said that our fathers told us that Jerusalem is the place to worship. Or on such a special mountain, this is where we have to worship God. And Jesus said to her, it is neither. But this is how you worship God. God is the spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And therefore, any time you come into the sanctuary, into this place, or in your car, or by yourself at home, and you want to talk to God, always think about this. Are you being sincere? God wants truth. He wants to see if you really acknowledge him for who he is. Because you cannot fool him. Simon says, I acknowledge my sin. Take care of the obvious things if they are there. Because God is light. Anytime you come to him, anything that is darkness in you will be exposed. You will know it yourself. Because God is light. Always keep that in mind. So if there's any darkness in you and you are trying to approach God, the darkness will be exposed. And so it is up to you to acknowledge it because the Holy Spirit is talking to you. And then you have to confess. You have to ask God for his mercy. And God will be so gracious to forgive you. Hallelujah. <laughs> So, we want to address the issue of courage by looking at a few scriptures. 
What can be some hindrances to courage? You know, courage, I think that we all understand, is having the strength to do what the tax ahead. And sometimes people don't have that kind of uh, grace. And I want us to look at some scriptures. Obviously, sin can be an issue. When there is sin, it is unconfessed. You don't have the confidence to approach God. But if you approach God and you acknowledge, that is the first thing that takes barriers out of the way. The second thing that I want you to consider when it comes to courage is to address the issue of arrogance or attitudes that are really prideful. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 13 to 16. It says, the slothful man says, the slothful man, slothful is being kind of lazy. Some people are lazy. They just don't want to work. <laughs> you know, they don't want to work. There are some people who, especially during this uh, pandemic season, um, the government came out with a lot of programs. So a lot of people were getting free money. So they chose not to work. And I think you all know. It was difficult, in fact, it still is very difficult in certain businesses to get people to work because some people have received free money. So they have become slothful. Okay? Slothful is refusing to do what you are required and supposed to do. You, you're being lazy about it. You know? And it, it always starts in the home. If you cannot take care of your environment, your own home, you're lazy to take care of it and keep it clean. You know, it starts from there. You're lazy to read the Bible. You're lazy to pray. I mean, everything, you know, it's like everything you are dragging your feet. But let, let us look at what the Bible says. The slothful man says, this is what he says. There's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, he's scared already. He's like, okay, <laughs> Man, I'm not going to go because and you haven't seen the lion, but you are just imagining that this is impossible. I cannot do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Verse 14. As the door turneth upon his inches. So that the slothful upon his bed. See it? See how the door, that door and any door has hinges. And that's what makes the door to swing, to close and to open. It has hinges in the corner there that supports the door. So it says, as the door hide, no, keep there. As the door tenet upon his hinges, so that the slothful upon his bed. So the idea here is that, you know, you are comfortable in your bed. And the sleep is good. Hallelujah. And the hour has come, especially in, in Gateway, we do get up to pray at 5 a.m. Eh? And when the alarm goes, or when you have to go to work, you know, ah, you just turn the other side. And you begin and continue to sleep. You don't want to get up because of the feelings. Hallelujah. Huh? As the door turned upon his hinges, so that the slothful upon his bed. Verse 15. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieves him to bring it again to his mouth. In other words, you have set table before somebody, okay? Dinner or breakfast. Food, there's food on the tray. Nice, pleasant threes on, on the tray for you. Okay, eat. And you are sitting down with your hand folded. As if you're waiting for somebody to come and cut the meat for you and put it in your mouth. And you're hungry. 
You want somebody to do that for you. That is being slothful. Hallelujah. So the spiritual connotations here is that slothfulness will not really amount to much in your life if you have that kind of attitude. Hallelujah. The next verse, please. It says the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Ah, you know, there are some people, no matter how you advise them, they are set in their own beliefs and nothing can change them. Even when the scripture is so obvious. So we have to have some open mind about things that pertain to God if we have to approach him. You know, because there are some things that can happen in your life and for some people, because of those reasons, they have come to con some conclusions that they can never pray and that God will not hear their cry. <clears throat> so let us give consideration to the things that God is teaching us in his word so that we can approach his throne. I want us to consider how prayer began in the Bible. The first time prayer is recorded in the Bible. So let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. And I want to read that quickly. It says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very rough, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou rough, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he slew him. Let's jump to verse 26. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. So this is the first time in the Bible that is recorded, prayer is recorded, that people began to call upon the name of the Lord because it is very clear there it began and when I read this passage um, I have some thoughts and I just want to share that with you so Cain and Abel you know the first sons of Adam and Eve they offered sacrifices 
and Abel's sacrifice was respected or accepted by God and Cain's own was not. And we don't know how, but from what we are reading, it looks like Cain understood that his sacrifice was not accepted. That is why his emotions began to go out of proportion in the wrong direction. His countenance fell. He was fuming. Abel was calm and quiet. And he also understood that what he had done was accepted by God. But then God tried to intervene and spoke to Cain. Look, the way you are angry, if you are not careful, something is going to happen. I'm just making it simple. Be very careful. You need to master this emotion. If you don't control this emotion, it is going to lead to something dangerous. Cain did not listen to God. And he killed his brother. And when I read some of the things uh, during my preparation, I found that so many years passed, almost 235 years. By this time, Seth had been born and had replaced Abel, if you will. And Seth also gave birth to, I think Seth was 100 and something years when he gave birth to Enos. In those days, they used to live very long, actually. Some 600 years, 900 years, 800 years. Hallelujah. Things are very different now. And... Uh, Seth had a son in us. And the Bible says from that time, man began. In fact, when you read the Bible, you find that the line of Cain, it looks like that generation, the people who came, the offspring that came from his line, they were replicating the behavior and conduct of Cain. Became very bad people. Very, very wicked and stuff. And uh, Seth his son, Enos, that line, they also, you can see that they, they began to pray, to seek God's face. So things went in a better direction for them. Now, I don't know, but when you think about it, why was it, why did it take them so long for them to start to pray again? I think that the loss of Abel put some kind of uh, sadness in the picture, the situation. If you lose your son, it's not an easy thing. So I think that for a long time, they must have been contemplating why God will allow them, I will allow that to happen. I don't know. But it took them quite a while to really, really gather the courage to begin to pray again. You know, so sometimes the circumstances of life, I just want to say very simply, can put you in a situation where it is difficult to pray. But prayer is necessary. It is needed. And some people don't realize that. And sometimes even when you realize it, it seems like you don't have the strength to proceed. So it is possible that Adam's family, they were so devastated for the loss of Abel. And for all that period, they just didn't find the courage to come back and to consult with God until the time of Seth and his son in us. I want to say that when people call upon the name of the Lord, God's grace is released upon their lives. Hallelujah. When you pray to God, grace comes from heaven into your situations. So prayer is something which you have to give 
very serious considerations because God, life proceeds from God. It is from him that every good gift and every perfect gift comes. So if you want God's blessings, you need to have a relationship with him through the channel of prayer. You don't just think it, but you actually do it. When you pray, you can, you can reverse some setbacks in your life. Because there are some things which God has really given us the opportunity and the grace, and it's obvious in the scriptures that we should pray about. If you don't pray about them, it is like, okay, you have been given these resources, but you are not using them. And so you can't blame God for that. So it is up to us to look at the covenant promises that God has made for us. That is why it is so necessary to be intense and intentional when it comes to reading the Bible. You cannot take the Bible as a casual book where you just randomly get to it only when it suits you. But you must diligently be approaching God in his word because the word of God, the Bible, is God. And when you do that, God's grace and mercies are released into your life. Prayer will help reverse some things that are going in the bad direction. Prayer will also restore hope. Because sometimes, without prayer, you feel that there is nothing that can happen. But when you pray, you can get hope that things are going to work out. And it brings some calmness into our soul. So that we are not troubled to and fro. The peace of God which passes all understanding begins to hold you together in this life. Because life is very stressful sometimes. Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 27 and 28. This is David. Praying. It says, and let thy name be magnified forever. Saying, sorry, I think go to 20, 20 uh, um, 26, let me see. Go to 26, let me see. Yes. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. 27. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, has revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore, has thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Amen. Oh, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. Verse 28. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Let's go back to 27. I want to point something out. Now, David was preparing to build a temple. A place where, a permanent place. Because in the wilderness they had always carried these tents that were moving from place to place to place. But finally that they had arrived in the promised land and things, the battles and everything had been fought. And um, David began to realize, oh my, I need to get a permanent place. He was thinking about it. Well, God said that I will not let you do it. But um, I'll let your son uh, do it. Uh, so when he received the message from the prophet, he decided to go into prayer to address the matter before God. And among other things, I just want you to consider what he's saying here because it's very important. 
It says, But thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, has revealed to thy servant. So notice first that there is revelation. In order to approach God, you need to have a revelation about him. And what I mean is knowledge is very critical. When you approach God, you must have something that you want to communicate to him about. If it is a petition, it has to be based on some foundation. Some, you should be able to reference from his own commandments that he has given us in the Bible. It makes it very, very, uh, how do you call it? easy if you have it uh, to be able to communicate to God and tell him that for this reason that you have said X, Y, Z, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Because it will build your confidence coming with God's own words. It says, you have revealed to thy servant. Because the prophet, God sent the prophet Nathan to speak to David. So based on the words that we receive, he understood that this is what God has set. Or this is God's plans or his thoughts towards him. So he comes to God and he says, this is what you have revealed to me. And God said, He's saying to God, God said, I will build thee a house. Okay? Therefore, has thy servant, what? Found in his heart. Now, I want you to look at the word found. F-O-U-N-D. It is very important. Sometimes, it is used in, in corporate, uh, setting up businesses. Or to, it says, we can say that uh, this is a person who found this city or founded this business. To found something means that you have set certain things together and you are about to take off with a dream. I remember when um, we decided to start this church that uh, the idea was not just an idea. We had to go through some uh, application process with the government, the state government, to register articles of incorporations, etc. All those things we had to prepare some documents and then submit it to the government, first and foremost, for it to be approved. And once it is approved, it becomes, it gives us the authority to set up a meeting place like this. So that anybody who comes here and questions us, we have proof. It gives us legitimacy to exist and to function. Hallelujah. So anytime we can meet, in the same way, when you have God's word in your heart and on your lips, you know, it makes it easy for you to communicate with God. And because David received word from the prophet concerning what was about to unfold in his life and the future. He says that because of this reason, I have found in my heart the confidence, the boldness to approach you, God. Hallelujah. This is the foundation that you need to understand that can make your prayer. It can bring about a change, a revolution in your life. You know, some people specialize in the negatives. For instance, if I say to you, you're a stupid boy, uh, you're foolish, you know how some people can take that just because of those two words? And I tell you, they can drive it to the moon. Maybe for a whole year or for the rest of your life, just because of those two words. Huh? They will hunt you down to try to just get you extinct on the earth just because of those two words. Hallelujah. But when it comes to the things of righteousness, the things of God, people seem to be empty. Why? Because they don't come to God through his word. And it becomes difficult for them to approach this invincible God. He's invincible by his real. But David said, 
I have found in my heart, based on what I have received, I am going to approach you. And I'm going to beseech you. I'm going to petition you. So he laid claim on that promise that he had received. Because God has spoken through his prophet. And that is how we need to approach God. I have five things that I want you to consider when it comes to prayer. Number one is that you must always come to God with the mind that you want to pray according to his will. Because it is not your will, it has to be God's will. Because you can never have it your way. You must have it God's way. That is why Jesus Christ set the example for us. When he came to the time that he had to go to the cross. You know. He understood that God the Father has sent him on a mission. And the reality just loomed in his face. He knew he was going to be crucify and so he went into prayer to talk to the father and when he raised his concerns or whatever he ended by saying nevertheless nevertheless in spite of all that I'm saying I have come to some understanding if this is what you have meant for me, I surrender my own will and I'm ready to do what you have chosen me to do. Hallelujah. If you have this kind of approach to God, you will always be victorious in life. Because God has ways and means by which he operates, which is not humanly conventional. God is spirit. He does things. His, the Bible says his ways are beyond our ways. So learn always to pray according to God's will. And if you want to know God's will, God's will is his word. Know the scriptures. Number two. Joshua chapter three, verse one to four. Bible says, St. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. Amen. <laughs> You have not passed this way before. But it is about to happen. And the only way you're going to do this is when you see the priest get up with all the things that they are carrying. The ark of the covenant. Because in the ark is the testament. Now, symbolically, what this is saying is that when God moves you by his spirit, because God is always leading us, he says, as many as are led by the spirit, these are the children of God. So when you're a child of God, God stirs within you the desire to pray from time to time. In fact, the Bible says pray without season, actually. But you find that there are certain moments 
that God by his spirit will stay within us. And sometimes, you know, he likes us to acquire some um, what do you call habits. Um, if you look at the life of Jesus, he set the example for us. The Bible says, a great while before day, that was his practice. While men were sleeping, he would get up and go into the mountain and pray to the Father. And in the morning, he would come down and begin to bless the people. So that was his lifestyle. Now, we are being told that Joshua advised all the people of Israel. They had come close to the promised land. Very close. And there was this river that they had, the Jordan River they had to cross. And they have been advised. Now when you see the priests get up and they are carrying the Ark of the Covenant moving into the land of promise. You also rise and follow. But keep a distance. Okay? The reason being that in those days the grace of God was not as it is today. You remember there was one time people were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and it was about to tip and somebody thought that he was going to fall so he tried to help. What happened? God struck him and he died. By now we are in a season of grace. And symbolically the only reason why there will be a distance between us and the Ark, if you will, is when there is sin. But when the sin has been removed, the Bible tells us, draw near to God with boldness and confidence. Hallelujah. Because Jesus has taken away all the barriers. So if we were in this situation today, there will be no need for us to have that space between us and the ark. Because the Bible says God has brought us into his presence. But an important thing I want to draw your attention to is that God is always tearing us up. He's always tearing us up. And it's up to us to obey, to heed that commandment, that prompting. Because God always desires to have fellowship with his children. A lot of people just dismiss it. Remember, when he calls you to pray sometimes, it may be in the time when you are sleeping. But what do you do? You turn your side the other way and you just ignore it. You know, you saw the passages that were read. Right, so now the opportunity has been opened for us. The way to God has been opened for us through the cross of Jesus. It says you have not passed this way before. But now, you are going to pass that way. You are going to approach God. God has opened the door for us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 says, Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both now he's referring to the Israelites and Gentiles. So at one time we were foreigners. We were outside the commonwealth of Israel. You know. But God through his mercy. When Jesus came. He abolished all the barriers. Remember when Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says the curtain in the temple was rent into two. So that everybody was able to see behind the curtain. So the Bible is telling us here that God is reconciling both, that is the Jews and the Gentiles, into one. Okay, we have become one with them by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Let's go on. And he came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Okay, that is referring once again to the Gentiles and to the Jews. For through him, we both, that is, Jews and us, Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Hallelujah. And so you can see that God has opened a whole wide 
gate for us to be able to approach him. Hallelujah. We have one spirit. We have access unto the Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's go on. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Amen. So God is making it very clear here that anybody who has received Christ, any, all the barriers have been taken and you can approach God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20 says that having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, and that is to say, his flesh. Ephesians 3, 6 to 12 says that, that a Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Okay? By the gospel which you are receiving right now. God has intended that through this gospel we'll become fellow heirs, partakers. So God has things in mind, blessings, goodness for our lives. So we don't need to go through life as people without hope. God has made provisions for us. And one of the means by which we can op- I mean, receive these blessings is when we begin to approach his throne and petition him according to the promises that he has made in this word. We, it is, this is much better than any promises that can be made by politicians to us in this world. Hallelujah. Verse 8. It says, <clears throat> let's go to next verse, please. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay? And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So there is a mystery that surrounds the relationship that we have with God, that the people of the world don't understand and they cannot understand because they are outside that grace. But when you are inside that family of God, this mystery will begin to unfold in your life. When you have that communication with God regularly, God is able to make all grace abound. And certain things that are not supposed to be in place will begin to realign so that things work out well for us. It says the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world, has been what? Hid in God. Huh? Certain things from the beginning of the world has been what? Hid in God. Until God releases it, nobody has access. But all these things have now been made available to us in Christ. God created all things by Jesus Christ. Verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers. This is God's intent. This is the mind of God. There are principalities and power, wicked spirits. Okay? But God has intended that through the church, which is you and I, and I you know, through us, God is going to reveal his wisdom. God is wise. In fact, he is wisdom. He's the beginning of wisdom. It says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. God's wisdom is manifold. That is that it's so many-sided. There is no end to it. Not, he's not limited with just one idea. He's limitless. Let's go to the next verse. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed, In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Hallelujah. Prayer must become something that you always look forward to. Okay? Because God has made it available for us to approach him to receive his mercies. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The last scripture I want us to consider is in Ephesians, the same 
Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. For this course, I want you to underline that and try to remember it. Okay, you must have a course. If you don't have a course, it is difficult to approach God. But Paul is saying that I have received so much. And for these very reasons, I am taking the next step. He says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That posture is representing prayer. It is showing that because of these things that I know, that God has revealed to me, I'm ready to bow my knees and to pray to God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me mention something to you quickly. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always have in mind the Father. Always the Father. God the Father. And always approach him through Jesus the Son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Learn to understand and to follow that order. Because God is a God of order. Always come to the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with mind by his spirit in a, in a man. So this must be one of your prayers. Okay? Paul is praying that you will be strengthened with mind by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. You need that grace so that you can boldly come before God to pray. Let's go on. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. What? By faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. It is very important to know that God loves you. And that he is so desirous of you to approach his throne. That is love. Stand therefore in that love. Next verse. It says that love may be able to what? Comprehend. With all the saints what is the breadth and the length. And the death and the height. Next verse. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. It is God's desire that you will be filled with his fullness. Let's move on. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. Hallelujah. He says so when you have followed these steps. You are approaching God. And you are addressing the issue of sin. Okay. The next thing is that you are not being presumptuous. You are not doing it your way. You want to do his will. So you come before him. And you approach him in the name of Jesus. Because of the resources that he has made available to us. The promises. When you have done that. His spirit, which is strengthening you in your heart and giving you the courage to approach him. When you do this, because everything is shrouded in mystery. Okay? You don't know how God is going to work things out, but you are just following through the, the pathway that he has set for us. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that is working in us. Amen. When we do it right, that power will begin to take action and bring about the grace of God and restorations and healings. Unto him we give glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages well without end. Amen. And so it seems like a whole lot of things that I've said but it is very simple. And I want to encourage everybody in this church to practice praying first by yourself. I know we have 
prayer times in the morning set for the church. But if you don't pray on your own regularly, it's difficult to even participate in group things. So, I, I, I appeal to you. Use the scriptures to advise yourself and come to God. Because God is a mystery. And he says that he has reserved these things for us before time began. Before the world was created. Certain things were hidden. Nobody knows about it. But now he's making them known to us. And he's opening access to us. Giving us access to him. To approach him. So, your marriage, your children, your business, your health, your friends, family, every area of life that you have to deal with, please, don't approach it with your strength. Begin to consult with God. Through Jesus Christ. Because he is our advocate. Come to the father. Talk to him. Gain that confidence. Let that spirit of grace. Come upon you. And when you do that. Every single day of your life. Will be filled with joy. And happiness. Yes yeah, sometimes. You will be discouraged. But you have to persevere. Because God is a mystery. And when you continue to operate by faith. Knowing that he is there for us. Then all things will work together for your good and your family. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Father we want to praise you this day. And declare that you are great. And your kingdom is everlasting. Your dominion, O Lord, endures from generation to generation. You have created all things. The earth and its fullness, Father, belongs to you. We come this day as your children, O Lord. We ask that your majesty, O Lord, be the light by which we walk. Let the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ be the love by which we move. And the presence of the Holy Spirit be the power in which we walk, O God. May your love, O Lord, be with us, Father. Let the tenderness, O Father, and the presence of the Holy Spirit clad in our hearts, Father, even as we go out of this place. May you prepare our journey, O Father, and let the Lord Jesus guide our footsteps and the Spirit of God strengthen our lives and our bodies. May you be exalted, O God. May any closed doors, Father, be opened unto you. May the King of glory reign in our lives. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share the grace. Let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We shall live and not die, but declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen.